Hi everyone, and welcome to this video where we look at uh, a model in my classic computer collection. And today we're going to have a look at the BBC B microcomputer. Now this microcomputer was released in 1981, so uh, let me spend a moment just setting the scene for you um, as far as an historical context is concerned. Now 1981 uh, was a time when the computer market was starting to fractionate. Uh, prior to that, you'd had general purpose computers like the TRS-80 Model 1, Commodore PET, uh, the Apple II. Um, and these had been general purpose computers uh, for hobbyists or for people that just felt they might have needed a computer, uh, possibly at home or at work. But about this time, 1981, uh, 1980, 81, the market was starting to split, so you had uh, machines being expressly developed for the business market uh, and these machines were characterized uh, by uh, 80 column screens 24 lines usually a monochrome uh, they tended to have floppy disks uh, they were well engineered they were quite expensive uh, things like the IBM PC uh, TRS-80 TRS Model 3 uh, and a host of 8-bit CPM computers would be examples and then you had the home computers and these were uh, computers that had um, good graphics and sound, uh, so they were good for playing games. Uh, they were um, ones that you could plug into the family television, uh, usually ran off um, cartridges uh, or cassette tape, that's how they got their programs. Um, and they were pretty cheap, uh, so families or homes would buy them. Some examples there would be uh, Commodore VIC-20, uh, the TRS-80 color computer. Uh, now they, even in 1981 though, there were still a few computers conceived and released that were still general purpose computers. So they did um, uh, a lot of these different things. Uh, they were neither set in one market or the other. And the BBC micro uh, microcomputer was one of these. Now it came about in an interesting way. Uh, it came about as a result of a tender that the BBC put out because they wanted the computer to start in their uh, television production called the computer program and they wanted a computer that could do lots of different things to sort of illustrate um, uh, what computing meant uh, at that time so they wanted one that could play music that had good graphics that, uh, that had color uh, that could use uh, information services to uh, retrieve data uh, they wanted one um, you could use to uh, teach good programming skills. Uh, they wanted one that uh, you could interface with a variety of things. And, uh, you know, maybe you can show um, some artificial intelligence. Or so they wanted a pretty sophisticated uh, machine. Uh, so they put this out to Tender and uh, Acorn Computers uh, uh, won the Tender. This was a British firm. And uh, it was a hard struggle because they went head to head with another uh, fairly... Um, uh, or predominant uh, and fairly aggressive firm in Sinclair Research, uh, headed up by Clive Sinclair. And uh, Acorn won the day, and so because of this tender, uh, they uh, they had the money to buy themselves uh, a very, uh, to, sorry, to build themselves a very nice computer for the market, uh, which they went ahead and did. And of course, um, in addition to that, they also uh, had a lot of exposure through this uh TV program that the BBC put on. So um, uh, it was all pretty good for ACOR. So let's have a look at the BBC Model B microcomputer. One of the challenges the BBC immediately faced on the open market was that by 1981-1982, microcomputers were falling into these two camps, either business or home. A machine was designed for neither of these markets specifically and so it was kind of a jack of all trades. In this sense, it was much like the Apple II Plus. It was far more sophisticated than that model, but without the latter's easy upgrade to CPM and hence the business world. Its high spec hardware, and some people called it over engineering, meant a high price, and for many British homes, it was simply unaffordable. But where it did find its niche was in British schools. And the very features insisted upon by the BBC tender meant it was an ideal educational package for 
things like learning, programming, and about computer technology. More than 1.5 million were sold, with Acorn claiming in 1984 that at least 85% of British schools had one, or at least one, BBC Micro. Now, while it was very popular in British schools, it never broke into the North American market. Here in New Zealand, sales were also low. It was simply too expensive, prohibitively so for home use, but also for New Zealand schools. And by the time school computing really got going here, in 1983 and 84, cheaper options such as the Commodore 64 and Apple IIEs were more favoured. So here's an ad from our New Zealand Bits and Bytes magazine dated November 1982. Price for the BBC model was almost $2,000 New Zealand dollars for a cassette-based unit, and you had to buy the cassette player on top of that. That was just over $1,000 in US money, so way too expensive for the home market, which was enjoying things like the Commodore VIC-20 uh, for at least half the price at that time. Now over time that price sank to just under $1,600 but didn't really go any lower, even though uh, Commodore 64s had replaced the VIC-20 in the home market, you know, again under $1,000, sometimes even lower. Interestingly, one of our main distributors here was a book chain store uh, called Whitcalls. They had their own short-lived computer centres, which later dealt with Sinclair Spectrums also. The choice of Whitcalls, a bookstore, as a distributor in New Zealand, cemented the perception of the BBC microcomputer as a high-market educational computer. Indeed, the very name BBC microcomputer implied a certain amount of highbrowness and class. OK, so time for a close look at the hardware. So here we see the machine. I find it an elegant design, albeit a little plain, uh, but to me it says well-made, uh, functional uh, and serious, although the red function keys do add a bit of dash and colour. It's an all-in-one unit, so there's no messing around with an external PSU and extra cables. I really like that. Keyboards, nicely laid out, and it's got a really nice feel to it when you're typing. Now under the grill, top left of the keyboard lurks a speaker for sound. And just below that you'll notice uh, a raised area. This is a, this is a cover that if you pop it off, uh, you'd see in there a socket for plugging in cartridge packs. And note finally the large flat top. It was very tempting to set a monitor on this, as you would say with an Apple II, uh, although people were advised against it. The case wasn't strengthened for a monitor, so it was a bit risky to put one there. Here is the label and logo. Now note the break key there. This key was a source of anguish for some users, particularly if they had had experience with other microcomputers. Now in most micros, the break key interrupted the flow of a basic program, throwing you back into the basic editor. And your program was still there, and you could edit it or restart it. But in the BBC Micro, this function was accomplished by the escape key. If you push break, it was more like a reset. So your program was gone. Although you could possibly recover it, typing in the command old uh, might get your program back, if you were lucky. Now even though the break key was up there out of the way, it was just so natural for students who had other models of micros at home to accidentally use it to stop a basic program. Um, Rumour has it that some schools actually disabled it. Here is the sleek profile of the BBC from the side. The socket there is an aftermarket addition for audio to bypass the built-in speaker. The BBC is a microcomputer just simply bristling with ports and interfaces. Moving around the back from left to right, we see a socket carrying a UHF signal, which allows the machine to be plugged directly into the aerial socket of a television. Socket next to that carries a signal for a composite monitor. Strangely, this only carries a monosync signal, uh, not colour, so it's just black and white. And after that we see three DIN sockets, one for carrying the output for an RGB monitor, uh, one for an RS423, uh, that's for serial communications, and uh, the last one there for, uh, is a cassette port for a cassette recorder player. Moving along we come to an analog in socket. This was used for joysticks and paddles, 
but could also allow the computer to monitor a wide range of sensors, uh, say temperature probes, uh, etc. Next we have an Econet port. Now the Econet option allowed BBC micros to be networked together so they could share printers and disk drives. Cover on this Econet connection hasn't been popped out, but the main board does have an Econet, uh, does have the Econet hardware on it. So given that ability for easy networking and sharing of resources, you can see why this was such a great school computer. And finally, we come to the power switch. Now I do try to keep my computers looking, looking nice and tidy. Uh, you wouldn't think it from looking at the power cord there. It looks like dirt, but it's actually some form of glue or gum, and it's really hard to get off. But that's not all of the ports. Uh, but wait, there's even more, as they say in the ads. And if we turn the machine upside down, we can see even more interfaces. So working from left to right, we see first up the tube. This is a high speed connection which allows other microprocessors to be connected to the beep. For example, a Z80, which will allow the machine to run CPM. Now naming a port the tube uh, reminds one of the London transport system and uh, the next port, the one megahertz bus, carries on this theme. Now this particular interface allows specialist hardware to be connected, uh, like online information systems found in Britain at the time. Uh, for example, Teletext and Prestel made use of this particular interface. Then there was another one simply called User Port. Sketch pads, uh, robot interfaces, video disk units, fast analog interfaces, or actually anything hardware hackers uh, like to build could be connected here. I've got a flashcard based floppy drive replacement, the uh, MMC solid state disk drive which plugs in here. Uh, more about that later. Moving along we come to the printer and disk drive interfaces and here's one really useful thing, a power output. This enables something like a disk drive unit to draw on its power directly from the BBC. Very useful for reducing desktop clutter as you don't need to have a separate PSU uh, for the disk drives. Off with the lid, and this is what it looks like. You can see that socket for cartridges to the left of the keyboard now, uh, as it's revealed, and you can see the self-contained power supply unit there. I had to change a blowing capacitor in that, and I can tell you things are pretty well packed together in there. It's quite tight and there's not much room to move. Here is the full board, uh, well laid out and well engineered. You can see a bank of ROM sockets on the lower right. Basic unit needed only two ROMs included. Uh, my one has a disk filing system, uh, or DOS ROM, and a ROM for the flash card MMC solid state disk drives. You could also get expander boards which plugged into a ROM so socket, giving the user many more ROM sockets and allowed the use of uh, all these ROMs through a paging system. This was called sideways ROM. On the left above the ROMs are some socketed RAM chips. 32 kilobytes of RAM was available to the user after BASIC loaded in a standard uh, BBC Model B. Finally, here's a stamp of the underside of the keyboard showing that this particular BBC uh, Model B was made by Acorn Computers in 1981. So here's the computer booting. This is the boot screen, so uh, uh, what you get when you turn on the... Uh, uh, the power switch. Uh, you can see there it tells us uh, we've got 32K uh, Acon D DFS which is, uh, means the uh, disk operating system is uh, activated and BASIC's waiting for a command so uh, we'll uh, put a floppy disk in and uh, see if we can get something going so just type uh, catalog here and have a look at the list of what's on the disk uh, this is actually the welcome disk for the BBC. I'll show you a, uh, a photo of the packet later. Uh, this was the disk that came when you uh, that you got when you purchased the machine. It had uh, really a lot of very simple demo programs on it. Um, they're so simple that I'm not going to show you those. Uh, I'm going to show you something that uh, just shows off the hardware a little more. Uh, this is Arcadian, so it's a, a Space Invaders clone. Uh, if you watched any of my other videos, you'll know that I really like Space Invaders. Uh, although this is, I suppose, Galaxians is, is really what this is a clone of rather than Space Invaders. Um, 
but uh, they just remind me of those arcade days. So uh, you can see there, um, pretty good graphics, uh, a few sound effects uh, as well. Um, so let's just uh, kill a few of these guys. I'm controlling this from the keyboard, just using the arrow keys. Uh, and of course, uh, the first level, like uh, all first levels with these things, is uh, not too difficult. Relatively simple to uh, uh, to kill our various uh, crafts. So um, we'll just clean up this batch here, and uh, then I'll quickly sh show you uh, uh, one or two other programs. Um, relatively straightforward, this particular uh, match. Very easy to get... Um, software for the BBC uh, off the internet then there's some um, a number of sites that provide um, programs so uh, if you've got a BBC in your collection uh, there's usually uh, no trouble getting hold of uh, some of these classic games so there we go and uh, we start all over again okay let's have a look at something new here's another acorn soft game this is chess um, Acornsoft was a major supplier of uh, BBC software. Uh, quite a good chess game, very easy to play. You just move around uh, with the uh, cursor and select the uh, pieces that you want. Uh, like Space Invaders, I'm also a great fan of chess games. Um, I think because even the earliest microcomputers uh, tended to come with a chess game, so uh, they're almost the quintessential uh, computer game, really. So uh, now this computer will be able to thrash me in chess, so I'm not going to uh, pursue the game very far. Uh, I think we'll probably leave it, uh, yeah, leave it about there. Now there was one piece of software, first written for the BBC, that had a great deal of impact on uh, gaming and gaming history generally. And it was this one here, uh, a package called Elite. Now, I'm sure some of you watching this video would have uh, played this game because it was ported to just about every other uh, computer platform uh, at the time, but originally written on the BBC Micro. It's a trading game. Uh, now, the only trading game I've played is uh, Taipan on the, the likes of the Terrace 80 Model 1 and the, the Ample 2. This is far more sophisticated than, uh, than Taipan, and I haven't played this one, uh, so I'm not familiar with it, so I'm not going to uh, actively try and uh, trade my way into anything, but really just show you the uh, the start screens. Uh, like a typical trading game, you um, uh, you start with a certain amount of money and uh, a certain number of goods in a particular place, and you can buy and sell uh, goods as you go through the universe. But um, uh, it, it is a game where you can build up your skill, and uh, the more skillful you get, uh, you know the uh, the better you are at trading, and also at um, raiding as well as trading so uh, you can become uh, somebody who's quite wanted by the authorities and uh, make a fortune in the meantime so you can become quite a bit of a pirate but um, uh, that's uh, the game Elite and as I say I haven't played it myself um, but uh, certainly it is uh, one of the games that uh, is had a lot of impact in uh, you know, the gaming world back in the uh, the 1980s. I did mention the BBC Welcome uh, Pack earlier on when we looked at software. And I have got an official version of this, but it's not disk based, it's a cassette version. And uh, here's the packet. Uh, open it up, there's a cassette there, a manual, and uh, some of the, the very simple programs. And essentially what these do... Uh, uh, illustrate various uh, aspects of the BBC, like the graphics, the sound, uh, the keyboard, uh, etc. Now, just before we uh, go on to the manual, I just want to show you this device. This is the MMC Solid State Disk Drive. A uh, wonderful little device. Uh, you can keep all of your programs on an SD card. Uh, plugs into the user port, and you can use it in conjunction with a standard uh, floppy disk drive if you want to. So here's a copy of the user guide. Uh, it's, it's quite a large manual, uh, 519 pages. Uh, pretty comprehensive, and it deals uh, mostly with the basic of uh, the BBC Micros. Now, the basic in, in the BBC uh, Micro is one of the things that really set it apart from other Micros of the day. 
and that it was such a complete version of BASIC. Uh, it had um, repeat until, as you can see there, it had procedures, it had functions, uh, it had a lot of oomph and it had a lot of, um, of the necessary constructs for good structured programming. And of course, this was part of the, uh, you know, the goal of, of uh, the BBC microcomputer that you were going to use it to teach people programming and you were going to um, give them the tools to write good structured programs rather than uh, spaghetti code. So uh, it's got a very, very good version of BASIC. It's even got um, an assembler in BASIC, so you can use uh, BASIC itself to write uh, assembly uh, code, which is, uh, which is pretty nifty. Now, one thing the manual does, um, again, different uh, from some other home computer manuals, is that it takes quite a serious approach to, uh, you know, to, um, to the explanation. So it's not as whimsical as some of those other home computer manuals. It doesn't have, you know, little funny uh, uh, or cheesy cartoons. It takes a, a fairly sober, serious uh, approach to the subject, just like the computer itself. I do have one other manual, and that is uh, the manual for the disk operating system or disk filing system, DFS as it was uh, abbreviated. Uh, was it the only operating system for the BBC? Um, a little later on, uh, there was a DFS, which stood for Advanced Disk Filing System. Uh, but DFS was adequate enough. Uh, this manual uh, goes through the various commands you might use. Um, perhaps one interesting thing about this operating system is that it uh, didn't uh, recognize double-sided drives. Uh, you could use them, but what it did is that it recognized each side of the disk as a separate drive. So uh, if you had one double-sided drive and you had a, a disk in there, um, essentially each side would be recognized as a separate a separate disk. Uh, so um, that was one of the limitations of this particular operating system. So there we have it, the BBC B microcomputer, a fine machine, uh, bristling with interfaces and ports, uh, fantastic version of BASIC, but just a little too expensive to make too much of a mark on home or business. And the education market in Britain, though, a different story. Well, I hope you enjoyed that look at the BBC Model B uh, microcomputer. Uh, it is a classic computer. Uh, I think it's one of these computers that uh, is vastly underrated, actually. Uh, certainly, when I got hold of it, um, and uh, had a good look at it and a play around uh, a few years ago. I was really impressed uh, with the sort of features it had uh, for a model of that vintage. So um, certainly pleased to have it in the collection. So uh, until next time, uh, keep well, and we'll see you in the next video.